In this video, I'm going to start the development of a new type of element, a beam element. And our focus initially is on identifying the degrees of freedom that we want to use and then formulating the shape functions. The element development will continue in the next couple of videos. Before we get into the development of the beam element in FEA, we need to do a quick review of beam strain displacement relationships from strength of materials. So imagine what we're looking at here is the side view of a beam that's going to experience a bending moment. And at the moment, <laughs> at this point in time, I've got a, a vertical cut through the beam. So we're not necessarily at the end, we're simply at a point where I've got a vertical cut. When this beam is subjected to a bending moment, we say that that vertical cross section remains planar, but it's now rotated by an angle phi. Similarly, the neutral axis, the plane on which there is no stress or strain, is also uh, rotated by that same angle phi relative to the initial vertical orientation. I'm going to start on a new axis, the y-axis, that uh, y equals zero on the neutral axis, and it's oriented in the original um, vertical direction for the beam. Now I can describe the displacements of points on that planar surface in terms of the angle phi. Specifically, I say that u is equal to minus y times phi. This is for a small angle approximation. So uh, the negative sign comes in because with a positive angle phi, I get displacement in the top half of the beam to the left and in the bottom half of the beam to the right. So for positive y, I have negative displacement. So now let's think back to the definition of strain that we've been using already in these, these video series. So epsilon x is equal to du dx. Now I know that u is equal to minus y times phi. So, and phi, I also know, is equal to dv dx. Now this is something that I'm not deriving. I'm simply going to tell you the uh, rate of change of the transverse displacement, V is the uh, displacement in the y direction. The rate of change of the transverse displacement with respect to x is the angle for a small angle approximation. Putting these two things together then, u is equal to negative y dv dx, and as a result the strain in a beam in bending, epsilon x is equal to negative y times d2v dx squared, so the second derivative of the transverse displacement. So even though we're going to talk about a beam as a 1D element, we are actually going to be considering displacement in the beam perpendicular to its axis in the v or the y direction. When formulating a new element, besides knowing the strength of materials information about what's going on, as we just discussed, we also need to make a decision about the degrees of freedom. That is the first major choice about an element, and everything else ends up being based on this choice. So for the beam, we know that because we're interested in the axial strain, because we want the axial stress in the beam, we know that we need to monitor the transverse displacement. But we also know that the slope is a critical thing to track. Secondly, we know that a cantilever beam with an end load has a displacement that varies cubically. In fact, inside of any beam, which just has point loads, we would expect a cubic variation of displacement. So it would make sense for us to try to come up with a cubic variation of displacement. Because we want a cubic shape function, that means we're going to need four degrees of freedom that are associated with the transverse displacement direction. Now, if we only have two nodes in an element, there's only one really good way to get additional degrees of freedom, and that's to go beyond translation and include rotational degrees of freedom. And that's what we're gonna do for the beam element because slope is important here. So this is my beam element, looks very similar to the bar element. I'm going to choose two transverse displacements, D1y and D2y. But in addition, to get the total of four degrees of freedom so that I can have a cubic transverse displacement function, I'm going to add slope at node one and slope at node two. Note that the direction of these is the positive slope direction, and that's going to be associated with a positive bending moment if I applied it at those nodes. 
So because we're adding slope as a degree of freedom, we're going to have to go back to the displacement field vector and redefine that so that it's not just displacement in the y direction, it's also going to include slope change as an additional displacement um, term. So finally, this is a what I'm calling a simple beam element. It does not resist axial loading, and that's because axial load is decoupled from the bending. So we will consider it, but we'll basically consider it by overlaying the bar element that was previously developed right on top of the formulation for the beam. So we're going to do that at the end of the beam development. All right, that's enough background. Let's get into the guts of this. When we formulate shape functions, we need to write out our assumed displacement field. As I said, we came up with four degrees of freedom specifically associated with the transverse direction in order to have four unknown coefficients so I can have a cubic function as I've written here. Just like we did with the bar element, we want to relate this expression for transverse displacement to the degrees of freedom. So we're going to evaluate transverse displacement at node 1, and we recognize that that is degree of freedom d1y by definition. When we evaluate the function v of x, when x equals 0, we get just c1. Similarly, at node 2, evaluating the function at x equal to l, we know that has to be d2y, and we can evaluate the function there where we see we, we get all of the terms, c1 plus c2l plus c3l squared plus c4l cubed. Okay, this is only two equations and I've got four unknowns. So here's where we need to remember that we have added slope now as an additional uh, displacement field. So I need to also take my transverse displacement function and differentiate it with respect to x so that I now have a slope function and this is a quadratic function rather than a cubic and then I also relate that to its degrees of freedom so I evaluate the slope function at 0 I get c2 and then I recognize that's equal to phi 1 and similarly I evaluate it at node 2 or x equals to l and I get an additional function so that's four equations and four unknowns I can write that out in matrix form or not as you prefer um, but then I can go through and evaluate this function with respect to um, finding out what C is in terms of the degrees of freedom. And we'll do that next. So using whatever solution method you prefer, you can solve that system of four equations and four unknowns. And you find out what C1 through C4 are equal to in terms of L and the degrees of freedom D and phi. Now what I want to do is plug those C values back into my expression for the transverse displacement V. When I do that, I get this full expression. The next step is going to be to rearrange these terms and to get the D, the individual degrees of freedom multiplied by some function. So I'm going to have a function that I'll call N1Y multiplied by D1Y and so on. So again, our goal is to rearrange those terms so that I have each degree of freedom multiplied by some function. That function, or that group of functions, are going to be my shape functions for this element. The, when I rearrange the terms, I end up with these shape functions. And you can prove this to yourself. I'm not going to go through the algebra. It's simply algebraic manipulation of the prior equation. So now that I have the shape functions, I can tell you what we've just done. We have derived the shape functions for the Euler-Bernoulli beam element. This particular type of element does not have uh, transverse shear included. However, it's still a very accurate element provided that the, um, the beam length to thickness ratio is appropriate. We can also go and define the slope field variable. So remember, this is simply taking the derivative of the transverse deflection field variable. And therefore, the shape functions for the slope degrees of freedom are the derivatives of the shape functions for the transverse displacement. Once we have the shape functions, we can work through the process of defining the B matrix, or the strain nodal displacement matrix. In order to get there, we need to know the uh, partial derivative matrix operator. I'll talk about that in a moment. But we also need to define the shape function matrix. Now I've gone ahead and shown you the shape function matrix here, and it's simply restating what we had in the prior slide. 
Um, so V of X is just equal to D1Y times N1Y plus phi1 times n1 phi, and so on. And then uh, phi of x is equal to something very similar, except it's the derivative of each of the shape functions. In compact form, this is simply for a beam element stating the vector u is equal to the matrix n times the vector d. This is just like what we had for bar elements. Now, in order to get to B, remember I need to know that strain, um, sorry, I need to know the relationship between strain and displacement. That's the one I just derived, but I need to write it in the matrix form as this matrix partial derivative operator. So the expression was epsilon x equals minus y d2v dx squared. In matrix form, what I'm really saying is that the vector epsilon is equal to a row matrix minus y d2 dx squared and zero multiplied by the column vector that represents the um, displacement fields. So it's the v of x phi of x column vector. So in other words, partial matrix, partial derivative matrix operator multiplied by u. So now B is simply the product of those two. Put them out, multiply them, and we find that B is negative Y times the row matrix D2 N1Y DX squared, D2 N1 phi DX squared, and so on. So the second derivative of each of the um, shape functions that we've defined. Now since the shape functions are known and are the same for all of these simple beam elements, we can actually evaluate the second derivatives here. So b is equal to that. Each of the second derivatives is a fairly straightforward differentiation. So I've done that for you here. And then we can rewrite the b matrix um, in terms of x and l. So we no longer have to take the derivatives. We've done that all ahead of time. Remember that, that the b matrix now depends on x and y. So the axial position in the beam, but also how far away you are from the neutral axis. Now that's exactly what we'd expect. We know that in beam bending, the further the, you, way, you are away from the beam um, neutral axis, the higher your strain and your stress. So we're going to use this in the next video to find the beam stiffness matrix um, in the local coordinate system. It's also used to do the stresses during post-processing, and we'll do that in the following video or the one after that.